Um, Borodown, good morning, everybody. My name is Oriel Miller. I'm the director of the IWA, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of Rethinking Wales. For those of you who don't yet know the IWA, we're Wales' leading independent think tank. We have a long track record of shaping debates and influencing change in Wales through our policy research and advocacy, our online and print publications. And I'm going to wave at you the latest copy of the Welsh Agenda, which is the longest standing current affairs magazine in English in Wales. Uh, we provide platforms for robust comment and debate events like today, as well as our agenda setting events. We're a membership organisation with members right across the country and much further afield. We're funded by our members, the events we run ourselves and independent trusts and foundations. This is the 17th, yes, the 17th in our Rethinking Wales panel discussions. And we'd very much like to thank the National Lottery Community Fund for supporting us in this chunk of the series. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, it's a webinar, so you won't be able to see everybody else who's in the room. So we really do encourage you to say hello. My dog has just said hello um, to each other and also uh, adjust, your, um, adjust your names to and add the organisation or the part of the country that you're joining us from. We're going to use the Q&A section for questions. If you'd like to direct your question to a particular panellist, do please state their name. We also encourage you to engage with each other in the chat. We sent around a list of participants so you know who advance, in advance who signed up to attend. Please do remember that all chats and questions are recorded and we're gonna be keeping the event strictly to an hour to avoid Zoom overload, but we'll be keeping the chat room open for a little bit after the end of the session if you want to carry on the conversation. So uh, the hashtag is Rethinking Wales, so do please use that. We're going to be live tweeting today's conversation too. This week has seen the publication of uh, the programme for government and one element of the programme, which has been a consistent theme for Welsh Labour policy since the election of Mark Drakeford as leader, is the creation of a community owned bank for Wales. Today is going to be a chance for us to explore what that actually means and what it might look like, but also to reflect on the situation that's made this into a key area of government policy. In earlier Rethinking Wales sessions, we have discussed the extensive impact of COVID-19 on Welsh high streets and the long-term implications of things like the rise of online retail. But perhaps the most impactful change to the high street has been the dramatic decline of bank branches. In the five years to 2020, Wales lost 40% of its bank branches. Bank branches are much, much more than cash points. They're sources of advice and access points for a whole range of services and of savings and loan services. For many small business that businesses, they're also an essential part of managing cash flow, as well as a source of investment. These closures have therefore left Wales in particular at a disadvantage with sparsely populated areas being particularly hard hit. Many of the most well-known high street banks claim that closures are the result of a fall in demand as many more people turn to online banking for managing their money. Many young people are less likely than ever to visit a branch often preferring to manage their money online. But as with other aspects of the digital transition, there is a huge risk of leaving a great many people behind. Today we're going to be exploring the changes that have brought us to this point and some of the solutions that are being proposed to support the response. I'm delighted to be joined by a panel that has a range of expertise and insights into the Welsh banking landscape and I know there will be lots of people in the audience here also able to add their uh, experience too. Uh, I'd like to welcome, and they're going to put their videos on as I say hi, I'd like to welcome Tegid Roberts, who's a director of Bank Cambria. Established in 2020, Bank Cambria aims to provide a full banking service across Wales, but unlike many, many high street banks, it will be owned and controlled by its membership, not by outside stakeholders. So welcome, Froiso Tegid. Thank you. Ben Joachim is Head of Strategy at the Principality Building Society and the Prince, Principality is among Wales' most recognisable businesses and manages over £10 billion worth of assets, serving customers throughout Wales and beyond. Ben's also on the advisory panel of Fintech Wales, which is an independent voice for the fintech industry, helping to champion the sector within Wales. So welcome, Ben. Good morning, thank you. Valentin Mulholland is Senior Policy and Propositions Manager at the Money and Pension Service, which is an arm's length body sponsored by the Department for Work and Pensions. 
The Money and Pension Service works to ensure that everyone in the UK can easily access the information that they need to make the right financial decisions for them throughout their lives. So welcome, Valentine. Nice to have you with us. Hi. Thanks very much indeed to you all for being with us today. We're going to hear from our panellists in a minute, but we also want to hear from you in the chat room and on Twitter using the hashtag Rethinking Wales. We've reached uh, nearly 1,500 people over the last year with these conversations, so please keep the conversation going. You can include your questions in the Q&A function and we'll be taking a good chunk of time at the end of the session to put these to the panellists. So, um, I'm just going to make sure I've got the chat open and I can see what's going on. There we are. And I would like to start with you, I think, Tegid, please. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Bank Cambria, because um, I want to hear really about what's influenced the founding of it as an organisation. Uh, what kind of problems is it trying to solve? Well, um... We were, Mark Hooper and myself were approached by the CSBA, which is the Community Savings Banking Association, about three years ago now. The idea of uh, creating a bank owned by its members in Wales um, and using model that they had. And um, at the time, I'd, you know, I'd been banking with um, a very large bank, a uh, global bank that started off as the Midland Bank and ended up as HSBC and over the years by my father and my mother ran a business and, and I, I have been running a business for 20 years and you know my contact with the bank has lessened and lessened and lessened and even living in West Cardiff bank branches have closed, the one in my village is closed, the one in the village nearest to us is closed, the one in the other village next to us is closed and access to banking has reduced and reduced and although my background is technology I'm ex Sony research and development um, and I have an app on my phone there are times when I do want to speak to somebody and consistently speak to the same person each and every time I have contact whether it's on the banking uh, retail banking side or the business banking side so Mark and I started to write up a, a proposal that we thought was reasonable for Wales we saw that huge amounts of Wales were losing their bank branches as well, particularly in rural areas. There are, we have, we've got examples of towns that have lost six bank branches. You know, a small town of 10,000 people have lost six bank branches. And, you know, you're going to have to get in a car and travel an hour or more to the next uh, bank branch. And, and that's unacceptable. There's no reason why bank branches can't, can't exist. Um, we've built a model that we think is viable where the bank branches that we want to open will be relatively small they'll they'll be um in the more rural areas we're, we're not going to have one a, a massive branch in the center of cardiff you know we're, we're going to concentrate when we open on the more rural parts of wales and we hope to open 50 initially and then we will roll out more as as we can um there's no reason why we can't do this because as a as a mutual we have no shareholders, we have no dividends to pay, and we have no stock options to, to, to distribute. So um, that profitability that you know bank large banking has will be kept within the organization and used for the community's benefit. And can you talk to me about the financing of the bank, Tegid? So we are limited with what we can say at the moment because we've got an announcement that we will go out. Um, towards the end, well, in, in the autumn. Um, but what we've done is we initially started as a ground up bank. Um, and we realized quite quickly as a challenger bank that it would take four years and many tens of millions in order to set up. So we were approached by an institution in Wales, I can't name at the moment, to partner with them. Now they have advantages over we, they already have a banking license, they have a relationship with the regulators and what, they, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're working together in order to roll this out. Um, and the crux of it is, is to make sure that we have a current account. So there are building societies in Wales but they don't have a current account and you know, there is no other bank in Wales that has a current account. And um, that is fundamental to what we're doing. Um, a current account in UK retail space makes about £400 a year per 
count on fees and all sorts of other, other things and interest as well. And if you think about 400 pounds multiplied by, you know, 2 million, however many people there are in Wales with current accounts, that's an enormous amount of money leaving Wales. Yeah. The Welsh economy is 75 billion and we're losing about a billion a year in retail um, um, funds. Uh, sorry, um, in, um, I've lost my the train of thought there, um, in current account fees. Okay, if we are able to keep that money in Wales, then there will be a distinct advantage. I'm going to come back to you for your elevator pitch, because answering the, the problems that it's trying to solve is what I want to come back to you on. Um, Valentin, let's come to you next, because one of these things and that's come out in the conversation with Tegid just there is about how um, a community bank might help people who are struggling to manage their finances. Um, looking at where Wales is now, both in terms of levels of poverty and deprivation and the impact of COVID. You know, your organisation, the Money and Pension Service, is working to support people who are struggling to manage those day-to-day -day finances. How, how important do you think that physical presence is of a branch for the people that you support? You're on, you're on mute, I'm afraid, Valentine. How can I be doing this after 15 months? It I happens to us all. It does very much depend on the characteristics. So we know that 76% of account holders are now comfortable with online banking. So we're talking about those who are not comfortable and we know that digital exclusion is a particular issue for the more vulnerable, um, for, for more vulnerable consumers. So we're talking about those people. And actually that also there's an element of digital exclusion in Wales, which is also about broadband connectivity. So even, you know, for those people who'd like to be included and where that's not a reliable source. In terms of people managing money effectively, I would say that there's three key areas where access to banking and access to a bank branch, if that's all you're going to have, is key. One of those is being able to be clear about how much money and, and, and you know, checking how much money you have, your balances, etc. And we know that, you know, there, there's evidence that some people on low incomes are doing that, are checking their balances on a daily basis and also are taking money out on a daily basis in order to manage and budget in that way. So, we there is an alternative to bank branches in through the post office so we know that the vast majority of um, bank accounts can be operated through post offices so you can deposit money you can withdraw money and you can check your balance but that's all you can do and um, but obviously access to post offices is also an issue that we're seeing the closure of a post office and what's critical is for those who are on the lowest income saying the nearest bank is three miles away or the nearest post office is three miles away it's still going to be inaccessible and you know three miles away journey in some parts of rural Wales could still take you half an hour and can be quite expensive as well so that's that's a really key point and the two things that you're not going to be able to access through a post office alternative is, and I think um, you mentioned it earlier, and I think Tegid did as well, is that access to savings and to affordable loans. It, it loans at a reasonable price. And a lot of people carry out both those transactions through their bank. We know that, you know, those who are digitally engaged might do that in lots of other ways. The credit union sector in Wales is really, really vibrant and the Welsh Government has put a lot of investment and support for that. So that's an alternative. But for those who aren't accessing to credit unions, not having a bank branch can mean that they're not going to have those more that encouragement to save. And for financial well-being, having a safety net for when, you know, for big expenses, for when life knocks you over and with an unexpected cost is absolutely critical. And if you haven't got those savings, then access to credit when you need it is critical. And that's where we think bank branches are essential to financial well-being, particularly for more vulnerable consumers, and where the concern is about that decline in access. I suspect we might come back in the chat to the role of credit unions in that in that in that mix as well. But let's let's save that for later. Um, ben, uh, Prince Palace has obviously got a really long history of providing banking services, and one of the things that's come out and Valentine 
pulled that into the conversation very clearly is around the challenges of digital um, and particularly the changes that that means for the high street and the, and the new challenges on top of everything else. Could you talk us through how Principality are responding to those sorts of changes and what you're also kind of prefiguring for staying ahead of the curve, please? Yeah, thank you. I mean, as a building society, obviously, we don't, we don't see ourselves as, as a bank necessarily. We, we provide some, some banking services, but we're, we're a mutual organisation. We're owned, we're owned by, our, by our members. But, you know, the, the shift that we've seen from, from the high street to digital has, has certainly been gathering pace. And, and obviously over the last year or the last, the last kind of 15, 18 months. And, and I think this, this, will, this will continue and it will continue across the different customer segments. And, and, and what we're seeing is more of, our, more of our members, more of our customers are using digital channels and therefore we, we need to respond to this. Um, and, and so our, our strategy is, is that we continue to invest in, in digital and data um, because I think understanding our customers goes beyond that branch relationship. How do, how do we leverage how do we leverage digital? How do we leverage data to, to understand our customers' goals, their, 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 their spending habits, their, their desires? And, and therefore, how do we translate that into, into the support? What, what we know is that we, we, we've provided you know, standout experience through, through our branches for, you know, for, for over, over 150 years, and, and we want to retain those branches. And, and we're certainly really, really proud of our, our, our high street presence. And, and from our perspective, we want to keep our branches open as, as, long, as, as long as we can. And, and as long as they're being used, I think that role of branches will 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 start to evolve, um, and and obviously we we continue to invest in in our branches, and and so it, it's trying to find that balance between you know obviously ensuring that customers have that that direct support on on the high street, but but that we're also replicating that in in a digital world. So it's it's a different kind of both and then, isn't it, from that perspective? Um, Tagged, let's come back to you. You know, you're, you're clearly seeing a future for high street uh, bank branches. Um, how are they going to be different to the banks of the past? How are they going to adapt? And what will that what will that look like? I mean, Ben's talking about know thy customer. Tell me a bit a bit about how that fits with what what the branches will look like in the very different parts of Wales. You talked about starting small and focusing on rural. I can I can see the logic behind behind that, but tell me a little bit more about about that evolution. So, one, one the services we offer will be across the board. We we will have a, an app. We've already got an app ready. Um, we will have um, a different size bank branch depending on the size of of the of the location. So some some of them are ATMs, but you can put money in, and then there's a video link, and then. We, what we do plan to do is to have relationships with uh, local authorities where we can put these units into and um, these small branches into local authority owned buildings. And also we, will, we, we, we hope to um, put these into smaller areas. We don't have the legacy challenges that a lot of banks have. We don't, you know, we, we won't need vaults. We won't need large infrastructure. So we were going to cut our cloth to the area that's required. And, and the bank branch, as it can, will evolve. Um, so we, we hope to have a larger branch in larger areas and, and small branch in, in, uh, in smaller areas. But the, the idea really is that, you know, if you get in your car 20 minutes away, you will be, you know, you'll be, at, you'll be able to get into a bank branch for 95% of, of the Welsh population. That's our goal. Okay, it's a different but that take. doesn't but that doesn't mean we won't have a digital solution. So I use my app a lot, but the the main reason I use my app is because I can't get to a bank branch. And um, although the post office does does offer lots of services for, for banking, there is at least a day or two delay. So if I put a, a check into the post office, there's a two day one or two day delay before it gets to the bank. So you're you're increasing the clearing time it's you know from four days to six days and if that passes over a week and and for people on low incomes that could be pretty challenging yeah, you know, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you're being paid with with a check because you've got a very basic bank account or on or you don't have reliable online banking and that is not the case for everyone in Wales I mean we're in West Cardiff well, I'm in West Cardiff and my internet access is pretty good here. But my 4G, if I go to the village in Craigie, the 4G there is terrible, absolutely terrible. 
So, you know, and then if you're in the more rural parts of Wales where, you know, 2G is challenging, never mind 4G, then, you know, you can see where the ch challenges um, get, get you know, acute quickly. I want to pick up on a couple of things. That video link that you talked about from the smaller branches, where will, where will that go to? That will go to a, a, a central uh, a call centre, so people will be able to talk to, to people. Um, so that's for the smallest um, um, solution, but we will also have, you know, bank branches where you can go in and you can to speak to, to somebody. Um, so we'll a real have, life person. We'll have, yes, it will have different size um, branches for different um, different size places. So at this this point, I'm going to do an unashamable plug for the project that we've been part of with a bunch of partners called Understanding Welsh Places, which I would expect both Principality and, and Bank Cambria to be using to have a story about that place's past, its present, and what the people of those places want their future to be looking to be looking like. And I'm hoping that the IWA team, somebody can put that link in the chat, please. And for those of you who are here today who haven't yet come across UWP, I'd ask why not? It's a really good way to understand what's going on in your place, bringing together publicly available data about more than 300 places in Wales with uh, more than a thousand people living in them from an assets-based perspective. Highly recommended. Thank you, Maria. Um, thanks, Tegid. I'm going to move on to Valentine. Uh, I want to know a little bit about what, if anything, regulators like the Financial Conduct Authority could be doing to monitor the impact of branch closures um, across Wales. It's clearly not a not a problem which is unique to Wales either. But could you tell me a little bit from from your perspective around that regulation piece? Yes. Yeah, so the Financial Conduct Authority has become sort of increasingly engaged in this, and particularly around a lot of the work around access to cash. So it's kind of associated as well with, you know, we've got the closure of bank branches, we've got an increasing move towards pay, you know, pay ATMs where you have to pay a fee. So that, that concern about the most um, disengaged, the most marginalized. And the, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority that regulates banks and financial services did published guidance on branch closures in September 2020 um, and but you know which sort of requires firms to have really clear plans for what the alternatives are going to be where a community is going to be left without a bank branch and in some cases we know that some banks are developing kind of hubs where you can go you know you can attend somewhere and contact your your bank in some cases online banking but um, there's mobile banking but we know that that's not you know that's quite a mixed picture because they often don't stay for very long where it, in, in one location so the fca does look at that but they, it's guidance it's not part of their strict rules um, and there's also the Lending Standards Board, which is um, a voluntary grouping of people who lend money and banks and building societies, has also got an access to banking standard as well. So that banks have signed up to this access to banking and say that they will go through particularly pro particular processes before they close a bank. And importantly, that they will consider what's going to be the impact on the most vulnerable people in that community. And if that can't be mitigated, that actually, you know, maybe that's not what they should be doing. I think it's it's quite difficult to believe that that's going to lead many banks to reconsider their proposals. And in fact, the FCA just a few um, a couple of months ago actually wrote to the chief executives of all the banks saying, you know, we issued this guidance last September saying you needed to take this into account. Um, COVID presents some particular challenges where we do need people to be able to access a branch, but actually some banks have been using that as an excuse to accelerate branch closures on the basis that actually that there's fewer people going in and, and the FCA saying, you know, that that's problematic and we need you to not do that and hold off. So um, the FCA are looking I, at it. Can I just ask, what, what powers do they have to compel the banks not to close? Any at all? I, I think it's guidance, so they don't okay. have powers. I think it is about reputation and influence and the fact that 
Treasury are very concerned about this access to cash, particularly and access to banking. So I think it's more in the relationship space. And that, yeah, that's what I was going to add. And I mm. think the FCA don't have big enough teeth in this, really. And and it's very difficult because, you know, what we know is where branches are being closed in areas where the kind of transaction levels don't justify keeping a branch going. Um, and that's the difference with, you know, the Bank Cambria proposal, which would be a um, publicly owned or, or mutual. If, it, if you're looking at shareholders, it's quite difficult um, when actually the kind of transactions are very small transactions in a particular small town um, to make a business case. And, and it has to be a business case that takes into account social impact rather than shared shareholder priority, um, which is where, you know, Bank Cambria has has an advantage obviously okay that's interesting um yeah toothless tigers in terms of regulators is a theme across across the board in a number of a number of mm -hmm. sectors isn't it um ben you're also on the board of fintech wales we talked about that at the beginning um and a lot of people see fintech and community banking as operating in very different spaces with different purposes um can you tell me about stuff that they could learn from from one another please yeah, so I, I joined Principality at, at the start of this year, and, and I've just been appointed as a non-exec to, to FinTech Wales. Prior to that, for the last four or five years, uh, I was building a, a challenge bank for the aid industry, um, for, or for, for international aid or for foreign aid. And so I guess, you know, I've seen kind of financial services through or, or the kind of the wide and the wider FinTech space through through a number of a number of different different lenses. And look, there are, there are upsides and downsides and, and benefits to uh, or advantages and disadvantages to on, on, on both sides. I think, you know, for, for, for legacy financial institutions, you know, they, they, they have that, you know, they have that history, they have that experience. Um, and, and, you know, and that comes, that comes with a, with a reputation and trust that's built up in our case over, over 150, 160 years um, for, for fintechs that are starting out, you know, they have that, that clean start, that fresh start, the ability to, to, to build, you know, build teams, build culture and build products um, from from scratch, I think you know from when we look at it kind of from fintech to the the community world, you know fintech certainly has a lot of experience in terms of how to deploy technology at scale, how to drive that efficiency and and the effectiveness. But on on the flip side, you know from a, from a community banking perspective, you know we have the experience of how to build those long lasting relationships and build them around purpose and, and around community. But I don't think that that value goes one way. Um, I think. I think these organizations can play can play both roles and I think both roles is is really important and I think you know in a Welsh context those those lines are even blurred further than the organizations that, that that we work with through through fintech Wales for example you know yes they're wanting to build you know big big techno technological companies um, but they also want to have an impact they want to have an impact on on their on their communities and, and and the reality is if, if we're going to do that if we're going to impact on our communities and, and our customers, Going back to the point I made before, we need to understand those customers, and that needs both, you know, great technology, both great data services, but also great customer experiences. And so I think I think there's a huge amount that we can learn on 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 both sides, and and that, as I say, that that value goes both ways for sure. And I guess uh, you know I'm going to follow on Tegid to um, a question from that in terms of what what sort of those sort of cross sector learning conversations have you been part of feeding into the setting up of a, of, a, of a new financial institution like Bank Cambria. And that's kind of first part of the question. I'm going to come back to you with a part two of the question, but let's just start with that first. So what was the question? So that, so Ben's been talking about those, um, you know, the, 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 the digital and, and data tech side of things and that, and that rollout and, um, and scaling up and the efficiency of that, but also knowing the customer base that you're serving. And I just wondered, you know, your kind of consultation processes and conversations with other, other actors and other players in this, in this sphere in, in Wales and elsewhere. Tell me about what you've learned a bit from, from those that has influenced the setting up of Bank Cambria. Well, Bank Cambria has to be digitally um, competent. No one is going to accept a, a new banking enterprise in, in Wales that doesn't have an app, that doesn't have considerable amounts of um, technology behind it. So although we will have branches and they'll be of various sizes, the core of the business 
will will still be technological. Um, the app that we've developed is is incredibly similar to to another. You know, we have I have a Santander app and I've got an HSBC app, and our app is going to be very similar, very similar. It won't look the same. It will be multilingual. It's going to be in Welsh and in English, um, but it'll be the same. And from that, we can gather the data that that Ben is referring to, and we can we can apply some big data, a bit of AI. I one of the other things I do is I I work with um, Swansea University on on an AI project at the moment. So you know I'm fairly well versed on, on the technology uh, required, but we still need that day to day service that we can go could go into the centre of a village or a town in Wales go to a shop, buy things, we pop into the bank to discuss the challenge that we have with our day-to-day -day lives. I really think that's an important. One third of people in Wales want a bank branch. Um, and 90% of banking in Wales is done with large global institutions who are intent on removing branches from Wales, although they, their profitability as a bank would, would allow them to keep them open. And they have definitely use COVID as an excuse to close them mm -hmm. um, because people haven't been using the bank branches and if people aren't using the bank branches then they use that as an excuse to close them. Um, so there, there are a number of challenges aren't there in terms, mm -hmm. terms of setting up the uh, a financial institution so let's just sort of dig into that a little bit more because you know from an IWA perspective we're interested in what what this means for policy policy um uh, shaping but also implementation of that of that policy obviously a key a key challenge so that that issue that you've just talked about in terms of is one of those key challenges obviously for 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 you what what are the other key challenges and what kind of support can policymakers offer in that space so what we've done is we've partnered with an institution in wales and together with them we've put together a proposal and the proposal has gone in front of the Welsh Government and the Wales Pensions Partnership. And between those two institutions, they have agreed in principle and they're going through a, a large due diligence process now to provide us with the funding that we need in order to be able to do this. And it's substantial amounts of funding. We're talking millions of pounds. And they will be members of Bank Cambria and it's you know one one member one vote so even though it's millions of pounds they'll only have one one vote each so that's important to to, to say um, and the other thing is we're going through the pra process at the moment we don't need to start from scratch because the institution that we're working with already has various banking licenses but can, this you, just seen... can you just explain pra to people on the call well, it's a prudential it's 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 part of so the fca and the pra are the, are the banking regulators in, in the uk and the and the, the pra is the is the body that regulates the banks themselves in terms of the um, suitability in order to 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 run um a bank and, and also if you if you want a banking license, it's with the, the prudential regulator that you, you, will, you will apply to. But we're not starting from scratch. We're not a challenger bank in that, in that regard. Um, in fact, the, the, the governor of the Bank of England mentioned us um, a couple of weeks ago. So there is support for what we're doing within the, the Bank of England. And this is, this is actually seen as a potential model for a new type of challenger bank. So to take an institution that already exists and allow them to work with them in order to provide you know, a better banking service mutually owned within. You know, so this is a potentially a, a model that could go across the whole of the UK. So Wales being a petri yes. dish where new things are being tried yeah. that others can learn from. We, we yeah. At the IWA, we always like that kind of, yes. type, that kind of approach, obviously. Uh, and that's actually quite exciting because this is something that could be quite transformative. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, OK, um, thank you. That's, that's helpful. Valentin, uh, we've talked about today during the conversation, you know, high online banking is already the future from, from, from that perspective. Um, and the importance of retaining a physical presence. Can we just dig into the issues around digital inclusion a little bit more, please? And can you tell me about either clever and innovative things you've seen 
um, whether in Wales or elsewhere, to improve dig digital inclusion. Digital is very difficult to say, I find. Digital inclusion, I have to enunciate very clearly. Um, from the point of view of, um, obviously, you know, the, the most vulnerable, because it will only ever be as good as you know whatever is offered it will only ever be as good as reaching the people who really need it from a day-to-day -day, uh, perspective um can you can you give you some ideas of some, some flavor about good stuff you've seen and that you would like to see in wales i think i mean a lot of the digital market is uk wide because obviously mm. you know you can get an app from anywhere in the uk mm. i think there is there is still there are people who, whatever we do, it will be quite difficult to kind of break that digital barrier. So some older people, although we're increasingly seeing a lot of older people who are very digitally confident, um, and some people who've got cognitive abilities, etc. So I still think that there's a role for digital skills development and digital skills development now is so key to financial well-being. You're not going to get some of the best deals if you're not digitally engaged so um, and I think you know regardless of whether you've got bank branches if you're looking for uh, a loan at the moment and you just approached your your bank it will probably be okay but if you're able to do comparisons online you'd get a much better deal so we we do need to see governments investing um, and I know the Welsh government has done that and I know um, there is investment, but I think in digital skills that really overcomes those barriers. We're also seeing some of the banks taking that on directly. So quite a lot of the adverts on telly at the moment from mainstream banks are around their digital uh, support. And I think COVID has really brought that to the fore. So when I was saying 76% of people are currently um, linked into an online banking that was 2020 figures I'm, I could not find yet the 21 figures that's going to be really interesting to see so banks have kind of put quite a lot of effort into that but then I think there is around there are fintechs who are very good at bridging that digital kind of barrier and quite a lot of people I mean we know that there's a lot of evidence um Lloyds do a, a consumer digital index every year. They do UK wide, which looks at what the barriers are. And what they find is a lot of people do use a smartphone for social media, but they're not prepared to use it for anything else. They're not confident. Mm -hmm. they're, they're worried. They've got, and some fintechs are really good at overcoming these fears. So that's about developing um, apps that really speak to the way people engage with social media. So what is it that makes them feel comfortable about Facebook and WhatsApp, but doesn't make them feel comfortable. And so we've seen, for example, some apps that are offering what they call current accounts where people get their benefits or their um, or their salary paid in that aren't actually banks, but that and, and it's interesting because all those people could have a current account with a bank, but actually something about that is appealing to them and it's the simplicity and how it's presented. So some of it's about that. And the other thing which I think is really valuable is what's called assisted digital so people who have you know who have an offer who have a, a product digitally but where when you start to struggle you can you can break off your digital journey and start to speak to somebody and that person might get over what you're struggling with and then you can return to your digital journey and I think assisted digital is a way for people to gain the confidence to do stuff digitally I mean um, you know, my mother's got two degrees and is in her 70s. And this weekend I tried to set her up on online banking and it was pretty hard. You know, it was it was pretty hard and she's hard of hearing. And the contact center was in India and she can't understand them. So there's there's an awful lot for mainstream banks to do. I think a lot of the fintechs, particularly now, the, you know, the early fintechs were techie young men. Um, and I think that's moved on so much and so much more focused now on looking at um, the, the, the clients who need to reach. And they're not just looking at the very wealthy clients, they're looking at different products. So I think innovation in itself will come up with some solutions, but we're going to have a hard core of people that will still need to be able to walk somewhere and speak to somebody face to face. That's interesting about the design of things. So like anything, you know, people who something is aimed at need to be involved in the design of it. It's it's just Absolutely. plain good old good old common sense, you know, and it goes everything from Jace, race to people who to gender to disability to everything. I mean, I if think um, people around the table. It's just not going to work. 
I mean, I really, we, we've, so we're developed, you know, we've got this UK strategy for financial wellbeing. And one of the biggest issues is around people with um, mental health problems and that people really get into difficulties because they've got some kind of, you know, some kind of issue. And what we're pushing for is to say that products need to be designed with that in mind, because that could be any of us at any point. Yeah. And actually, we know that people with mental health problems get into much more financial difficulties and financial difficulties in themselves exacerbate mental health problems. So that kind of inclusive by design is absolutely critical. Mm, thank you. Um, I'm going to give a last question here to Ben, and then I've got a stack of questions from the audience. So Ben, uh, Community Bank in, in the works, also the Development Bank recently established, um, as well as your own organisation, which has been around for a little while longer, um, and a strong credit union. I know there's a comment from Mark White on the chat there. There's a re real range now of both saving and lending opportunities within Wales. So I want to just say, you know, is, is there a bit of a risk that these organisations end up competing one another to the detriment of the people that they're trying to serve? Well, I think, I think firstly, competition is a really good thing. I think competition is really important. It's good for our customers in terms of how we can drive value and improve services and ensure that we're, that we're, we're, we're providing them with what they need. I think competition is also good for the high street, ensuring that we can have a buoyant high street and, and vibrant, vibrant communities. But if we're going to have competition, I think competition needs to be on, on a level playing field. And you know, I'm thoughtful that if, if government is going to take an interventionist approach, that they, they have a, a responsibility to ensure that that level playing field exists. And and that they should be able to encourage encourage innovation uh, across the board, but I think what what we need to do is understand understand the overlaps when we talk about competition and and understand that you know when we think about in in the context of, of, of savings and lending for example that there's there's a big there's a big spectrum within within that it's not it's not just one you know it's not just one product um, one one savings product or, or one mortgage product let's say. Um, and so when, when we look at, you know, competitors and, and understanding what, what are their services, you know, potentially there may be some overlaps between, between DevBank and, and Cambria, you know, you'd, you'd hope not if, if they're both Welsh government funded, um, you know, there are some overlaps between what, what we do on a, on a commercial lending perspective uh, with what DevBank are doing. And, you know, Teg has already, you know, uh, articulated, you know, the, the, the current account focus with, with Cambria and, and, and we're very clear that we, we don't provide a current account and, and that we're, we're focused very much on, on, on savings, savings and lendings. But I think, I think we also need to understand what, what are the markets that we're, we're looking to serve. Obviously, Principality is, you know, as a 160 year old uh, uh, financial institution or, or building society with, with that history and, 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 and a heritage in, in, in Wales. But, and, and we also have, you know, the, the biggest physical presence across, across Wales, but, but our focus isn't just, isn't just Wales. We, we, we lend a significant amount of our, of our, of our mortgage portfolio in, in, into England. But I think, you know, I think in, in Wales, we're, you know, we're sometimes accused of, of kind of operating within silos as, you know, within, within different industries. Um, but that, that collaboration is, is, is really important. And, you know, we, we've had conversations with, with Bank Cambria, you know, prior to me joining over the year and, and, and explored different, different ways that we, that we can partner. And so, you know, I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other as well. And, and, and so that notion of competition isn't, isn't as clear cut or, you know, it's, it's not cutthroat in that, in that regard. Um, and that we want to create, you know, a collaborative ecosystem, a collaborative in, environment across, across Wales. Okay, thank you. Um, Tegan, I'm going to come to you with a question from Nick Clifton, who says, um, are there examples of the kind of challenger stroke replacement model in other places outside Wales and indeed the UK? And if so, what have been the main issues and solutions? Obviously, you know, he's saying that regional banking is much more of a thing in places like Germany, for instance. Yes, two thirds of, of banks in, in Germany are, are you know, local banks, and, and also the, you know, the, their development bank network is considerably larger than it is here. Um, within the CSBA, so the um, organisation that we've been working with, there are other challenger banks um, that are set up in the same similar model in, in the UK. Um, in the west of west of England, up in the northeast of England, and, and some in London, and we've been, you know, we have been working. But at the moment, Bank Camber is the one that's ahead of all of them. So, um, in terms of the UK, we we will be the we will we will be the first over the line. Um, if if we look at community banking in in other parts of the world, so Santander, although they are reducing the bank branches in the UK, they have 
enormous community banking facilities in South America, for instance. I mean, they've got bank branches absolutely everywhere. And that has been a core to the Santander model for, for, for many decades. Um, the UK has become a, a bit of a problem when it comes to provision of, uh, of banking. Um, so if Santander are reducing their portfolio in the UK, then you know, this is, this is a, a, a huge challenge to us because they're certainly not doing that in other parts of the world. Um, so, um, I mean, one of the disadvantages of some of the challenger banks in the UK is they, they've had to raise substantial amounts of money. They, you know, we're talking 50, 60 million. Um, and also the PR process that they've been running through has been uh, very extended for five years. Um, and one of the reasons we've partnered with, with an institution that already exists in Wales, and a Welsh institution, is so that we can get over the line quicker. Uh, and we've managed to reduce that time from four years down to two years. So, you know, that's, um, and two years is, you know, from my point of view, long enough. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to move on to a um, question here from Adam Howell who's raised a really important issue about skills. And I think Valentini touched on this earlier and how young people actually gain skills by engaging with banks face to face. Um, is there a wider issue, do you think, about changing skills in the Welsh banking sector? Do we have the skills to provide the kind of variety of services that we've been discussing today, both in person and in digital? That's for all the panel. I may not get around you all because I'm conscious of time, but Valentin, let's start with you on that one. I think I'm probably more um, able to respond on the children and young people part mm. of it because Great. we're very clear that the, the best way to ensure that people have the personal skills to manage money effectively in the future is educating children and young people and we believe that all children and young people should have a meaningful financial education and we're actually working with the Welsh Government and in partnership in Wales um, to, to, to deliver a number of activities which, which are around financial education of young people, but also through parents. So some of those activities, one we call Talk, Learn, Do, which is actually about very young children, is about teaching parents how to talk to their children about money. And some of those interventions do rely on there being some kind of element of cash, you know, that um, it's, you know, I mean, although there are increasingly there's some really good apps now for um, young people um, and children and young people like Go Henry and, and others that, um, that encourage financial capability. But for very young children, it is about understanding the tangible concept of, of cash. And I think you're right that um, in, in that question, that sort of going into bank branches and, and you know, modelling that, you know, as children, modelling what happens, those transactions, putting money in, taking money out, et cetera, just to understand what that is. But I think, um, I think in financial education, then we're responding, you know, to what, what we do, which is around a new environment where actually children are going to see much cash and they're not going to see a, an interaction with a financial professional, but how do they learn about the value of money, about savings, and about, um, about how you manage money effectively. But I will defer to my banking uh, colleagues about the skills in, in staff there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you, Ben, in, in, on this. I mean, as a parent, one of the ways I've te I'm teaching my kids about, about money is the chocolate tax, obviously. 20% of the chocolate goes to the parent first, like the government. But also, I, you know, this is, I've, already said this on Rethinking Wales, it's no great news, but um, my kids do have a principality account actually and look at how they are accumulating pocket money or birthday money and what they're deciding to spend it on. And I think, yeah, I agree with you on from that perspective, Valentin. Um, can you talk a little bit, Ben, about this thing around skills? Um, Valentin's talked about young people in particular. What else? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, from, a, from a principality perspective, you know, skills and education for, for, for our young people acro across the nation is, is, is really important. We, we do a huge amount of work across, across Wales um, in schools through, through our, our FinEd programmes, our financial education programmes. And, you know, we have an ambition to, to expand that even, even further. We, we, we now have a, a, a kind of a, a savings education app. Um, that young people are able to download, which, you know, I think goes alongside and, 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 and provides wider, wider support. I think, you know, I think clearly, 
clearly uh, and with a kind of a fintech Wales hat on, we're having a number of conversations with, with Welsh government now in terms of how do we embed that even further into the curriculum? And, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's a challenging conversation because if, you know, if you've embedded everything that everyone wanted to embed into the curriculum, I think, you know, our children will be at school probably 20, 20 plus hours a day. Um, but we recognize that, you know, it's, it's really, it's really important. And I think, you know, and that, that needs to, you know, that needs to start at a younger age and continue throughout that educational experience and in, into university. And, you know, we, we know that we've got young people coming out of university that still, still don't really understand the, fi the, the realities of, of, of financial management of, or of mon managing their money effectively. And so, you know, I think, I think in Wales, we're doing, we're doing a good job and, you know, I'm really, really proud to, to be involved in, in a number of kind of different initiatives, but I think there's a lot, a lot more that we can, a lot more that we can be doing certainly. And it, yeah. Interesting to hear about that Savers Education app. I'll go and check that out. Thank you. Um, take it, okay. Um, Take it, I'm going to come to you. There's a there's um, a comment from Chris Thomas from Planet and Katie Fowler, who both raised the issue of investments and what banks do with our money. So they've highlighted investment in local community institutions and divestment from fossil fuels. Um, just out of interest, and I saw in the chat there was a question about how you get pension funds away from away from that as well. And uh, the IW actually published a paper on. Um, calling on local authority pension funds to divest from fossil fossil fuels i think three years ago and as a result the future generations commissioner picked up on that and we're starting to see that we have already started to see that divestment and reinvestment in renewables which is what we wanted but could you tell me a little bit about you know do you think community banking is going to be much more likely to invest in this value orientated way uh, bearing in mind the principles and the values on which you are being founded and can we get mainstream institutions to do the same? I can get mainstream institutions to do the same is, is above my pay, <laughs> pay level. Um, Nothing is above your pay level, <laughs> Teddy, surely. <laughs> yeah, when you're doing it for free, certainly. Um, Bank Cambria, um, Bank Cambria will, will have a policy to, to, to invest locally. So we will have, uh, in time, we'll have a small business account. We will have small business loans. And I'm hugely, um, hugely keen on developing Welsh businesses. I'm also hugely keen on developing um, the cooperative movement in Wales as well, because ownership is, is really important. Um, one area of the Development Bank of Wales that I would like to see um, increased is the amount of money that's available to cooperatives and turning businesses that are just about to be sold in a trade sale into cooperatives. So, you know, that's an entirely new area. Um, um, we can discuss that another time. But I, I would be very keen for Bank Cambria to have a cooperative focus. There's no doubt about it. We yeah. make sure that we can keep the money in Wales as much as we possibly can. Part of that missing middle conversation, yes. you know, lots more S's rather than the M's and the E's. Yes. Um, I'm conscious of time, it's five to 12. I'm just going to note a couple of other comments that have come through. So Sarah, Sarah, excuse me, whichever one you are, um, head of fundraising for Marie Curie in Wales has talked about the closure of branches across Wales having a significant impact on volunteers banking income from activities such as collecting tins and buckets and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, John Ashton has asked, and Alex Bird has also raised this issue around Welsh language issues is in the provision of banking services. Is the problem a lack of skills in the profession? Um, and I wonder, Ben, if that's something I can come to you on from the point of view of somebody already in the banking system, the kind of uh, the language issue there. I know there have been some conversations in the chat already. And so what's the, what's the specific question? Is that is that a challenge, the language barrier? Yeah. Is it is it is the problem a lack of skills in the banking profession, Welsh language skills? Look, I mean, I, I, I can't I can't talk for for other institutions necessarily. But, you know, I know that we as principality, you know, we have a number of, of bilingual speakers, you know, all, all our all our communications on our website and, and, and to customers, uh, depending on their needs is going out bilingually as well. Um, and so, you know, it's something that we're, we're certainly very, very aware of. Um, and I think, you know, I think in, 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 a in a wider context, you know, people, people have different perspectives on, on the Welsh language, but it's certainly, you know, a, a fundamental part of our history and heritage and, and something that we want, we want to retain for, for, forever. And, and so we as an organization and, and, and you know, our, our colleagues on this call and, 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 and across the nation have, a, have an important part, an important role to play within that, certainly. 
Um, strong defense of it there. Okay, I'm, there's another uh, point here from Mark White of Smart Money Cre uh, Cymru Credit Union. Um, we talked about credit unions a little bit today. We pointed out that they are moving into the digital space as well, offering loans online and offering transactional services online. How do these different institutions interact? Are there forums for discussion? I guess, Tegid, maybe that's one for you in that kind of developmental phase. Yes, absolutely. Um, if we can support the credit unions in what they do, then we, we're happy to. We've, we've had many conversations with the credit unions in Wales. Um, we don't see ourselves in competition with them. We see ourselves in competition with the large global banks. That's the, you know, I don't see us as being in competition with the principality or the building societies either. Our competition is the large global banks um, because they, they are the ones who are reducing services in Wales and, and extracting cash from Wales, cash that could be better placed and used in Wales. Um, I'm not against profit and I'm not against shareholders in particular, but banking has been a fundamental problem in the UK for at least 20 years now. From the banking crisis onwards, I mean, we should have learned some things here. And the fact that Wales hasn't had its own, own bank uh, with, you know, with a proper current account is a little bit of a disgrace, really. You know, that's, we're, we're, Mark Hooper and myself are fundamentally, you know, fundamentally keen on getting this, getting this going. Um, yeah. and I can to hear make that sure, Really, really, you know, really passionate about this. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, you know, lots of difficult uh, times with banks over the years when my, my wife became ill, and, and this is that we, we will have our revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and on, on, on that note, I'm going, to, I'm going to start wrapping things up. Um, there's a conversation that's come through about cash. I'm afraid we won't have time to address that. I just want to say thanks very much indeed for everybody joining the conversation today. I know there's been lots of stuff in, in the chat, so we'll just keep that um, open for a little bit so you can catch up on that. I'd really like to thank our panelists for giving us their time today. So Tegit Roberts, to Ben Jerkim and to Valentin Mulholland. Thank you very much indeed, Jochen Vaar. If you also want to receive early notification of all IWA events and recordings of all of our Rethinking Wales sessions, please do join us as a member and a member of the team is gonna put that link in the chat now. Membership is really important to us. It allows us to do things that others can't, won't and aren't able to do because of vested interests. Um, we don't have those vested interests. We can say what we want, when we want, how we want, to whom we want. Um, it also means that you too can play your own part in supporting a, an open, politically independent and constructive organisation at a critical juncture for Wales. We don't represent a sector, trade or interest. And I think that's what's been really interesting about these uh, Rethinking Wales sessions over the past year. So thank you very much indeed for attending and we look forward to seeing you again soon. We're currently shaping up our events program for the next year, 18 months. We're really interested to hear what you would like us to focus on as well. So a very short survey is going to appear in the chat. So do please fill it in if you get the chance. In the meantime, we have one more Rethinking Wales session before we break for the summer. So do please keep the morning of Thursday, the 8th of July free. Jochen Bauer, everybody, and thank you.